Hello. Welcome back to Music in Mind. It has been way too long since I've done an episode, but uh, I'm going to be getting back into it. I've been focusing on my other podcast with Sap and Claw Elixir. Um, that's called Afternoon Tonic. That's with uh, Brother Nate in Sap and Claw Elixir, and we talk and discuss sort of political ideas and musical ideas and things like that. So I'm going to be bringing music in mind back into it just as part of my practice, talking with other musicians, exploring specifically musical ideas, and I might try out a new format where uh, weeks that I don't have a guest, I might read an article about music and just discuss my own ideas about it. We'll see. That's a, that's a potential idea in the works. But this week's episode, the episode back after a few months off of Music in Mind, is with Maxwell Henry. This is actually his third appearance on the show. I think he has been the most frequent guest on this podcast. We used to do episodes about every year. It's been a little while, so it was great to reconnect with Max, and we got to talk about his music practice, what he's been up to. Max is a composer, a drummer, a pianist, a producer, music technologist based out of New York. He's just finishing his master's uh, from NYU, and we talk about what that's like. We talk about music in academia. We talk about the value of music. We talk about music production, music composition, our histories as composers coming out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it's just a really cool conversation. But before we get to that, a few announcements, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm playing some shows with my band, Sap and Claw Elixir, coming up on May 13th, which is next Friday. I'm playing a show at the Green Jay, along with the band Cellophane Sun and Flavor, this show is to celebrate our new EP that we are releasing next week. This is Sap and Claw Elixir. We recorded it right here in my room, and we've been mixing away, mastering, getting it all ready to release. So that is so that's coming out next week, and we're doing a show to celebrate it. Then after that, the following week, we're also playing a show in L.A. at The Mint. That's an 11 p.m. show on Wednesday, May 18th. And then after that, we are playing a show. The next show is Thursday, June 2nd at Celis Brewing back in Austin. And then after that, we're playing on Sunday, July 3rd back in L.A. at Universal Bar and Grill. Also, check out my website. I'm playing uh, around Austin all the time. I go out to jams. I play around town. I'm also playing with Candace Bellamy, who's an R&B artist. I'm playing with Solero Salsa, which is a salsa band. I'm playing with Joyce Taus, cover band, Ruby Groove, another cover band. So come out, hear some music if you take a look at my calendar. Also, if you like my content generally, please consider supporting my podcast, my music in the value for value model which is a model that I got from the No Agenda podcast hosted by John C. Dvorak and Adam Curry. And this is the idea that if my content provides value to you, I ask that you respond in kind by providing value back to me. And you can do that in a few ways. You can donate to my Venmo. You can donate Bitcoin through this QR code over here. Or you can subscribe to my Patreon below. And I have various tiers, so you can subscribe for $5 a month, $10 a month, whatever you feel comfortable subscribing for, and each tier has little bonuses that you get uh, along the way. Extra content, the ability to submit topics or questions for me to address on the show, things like that. All right, let's get to the show. Welcome to Music in Mind. Music in Mind with Anthony Coffey. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so we're back with probably the uh the most common guest at this point on the Music in Mind podcast. This is the third the third time veteran Maxwell Henry. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming back on the podcast, man. It's been a while since I've done since I've done one of these. So you're yeah, I think you're funny. the inaugural like return of the Music in Mind podcast. Oh, that's dope. so. Wait, so you didn't do any like during the pandemic? No, no, I did. I did. It's just it's been a couple of months because I've been I've been doing the other podcast with my band and I've been trying to get an EP out and everything. So I did one a yeah. couple months ago. No, well, I've been I'm like happy. itching itching to get back into it. So like when you contacted me, I was like, yes, this is it. It's I bad. know. Well, it's funny to say that I've I've been on the most because each time that we've done it, it's been like a healthy amount of time in between. Because, yes. like, the first one was in, like, 2018, and the second one was, I guess, maybe in 20... So, I guess that was only a year, but then... It was very unhealthy. It's been, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been since 2019. So, yeah, and it's it, but it's funny, because, like, even since we graduated, like, we've somehow just kind of peri- periodically, like, yeah. reconnect for one reason yep. or another, which has been cool. 
It's great. I mean, I'm bummed that I'm not in New York to hang out this time. Because, like, I, 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 I had these, like, kind of annual trips to New York, and I'd come and hang out with you and Daria and Nick Connors and stuff. I know. Yeah, I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen Daria, I think, probably since the last time we... Yeah, well, she's back at UW-Madison. She's doing her PhD. I th- Yeah, I think I remember you telling me that. I definitely yeah. forgot about that. Is it in composition? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Wow. Good for her. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, so wait, is, is, is she studying with Schwendinger? Yep. Mm-hmm. Is there another, how, have they like grown the faculty? Um, I think that Les Thimig has taken on some of the comp students and Mark Vellon yeah. and uh, like a few of the other faculty who do composition have taken on some of the students, but I think <laughs> it's primarily Laura running it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's awesome. I'd love to hear like stuff that she's she's doing. Dude, she's got an I, awesome YouTube channel. Have you seen it? No. She does these videos about about the piano videos, like teaching people how to play Chopin and stuff. And some of them have like thousands of views. Like she's, what she's the killing it. Fuck. <laughs> wow. This Why is, did this I... is Daria Tanikova, everybody. So look her up. She's a badass piano player, amazing composer. Dude, I literally type in Daria 10 and she's she's popping up. Wow. Yeah. Dude, she finished her piano concerto. It's already there's already a performance here. Yeah. Why don't I know this? <laughs> I was literally just gonna say the last time I was like talking with her, she was writing a piano concerto, and I was so wow, I'm gonna listen to this, I guess, after. Yeah. But that's so cool. So, so for any any anybody new listening, just a little a little history. So so Maxwell and I, <laughs> you can call me Max. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell Henry and I uh, yes. went to uh, University of Wisconsin Madison together. Uh, we were in about the same class. I don't know, I don't remember if we graduated at quite the same time, but yeah, basically yeah. 2014. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but we, we were in the, the composition department at the music school at University of Wisconsin-Madison with uh, our amazing and unfortunately deceased professor, Stephen Dembski. Um, yes. Big, big influence in both of our lives and our musical thinking. Um, and so there was a time where we were kind of like reconvening every year to hang out, do a podcast and stuff. So it's been a little while because of the pandemic, but... Max is an awesome composer, and we were just talking about another composer we were there with, Daria Tinikova, uh, who's another badass composer, so everybody should look her up. But uh, so, yes. Max, what, what have you been doing musically? What's your Yeah, well, name? actually, uh, it's cool, like, a, a couple different things, but what's most, I guess, recent or imminent is I'm finally graduating uh, from NYU with my master. Wow. And nice. Is this this spring? Like in like two weeks. Yeah. Congrats. That's awesome. Yeah. No, I'm, uh, I'm stoked. And it's like, j- like, it's funny because I started the program back in fall 2017. That's when I like moved to New York. Mm-hmm. I did a year of the program and like, <laughs> funny enough, like has have like an existential music crisis and was like, I don't know if like, this is the path for me and like the, the universe happens and I ultimately came back to music in Mm -hmm. the best way. And I'm so happy that, and honestly, like on the other side of it, it's like, I look back on that time off and it was like super necessary. Uh And like, it helped me find like what I want. Like, I didn't know what I was going to do until I found out what music producing was. Mm -hmm. So during the pandemic, actually, it was like, that was the first time I really dove into like Dawes and like the technology side Oh, of things right. and then realized that like my background in composition was almost like kind of the direct skill set of what certain kinds of music producers absolutely do. yep arranging orchestration uh-huh. building songs like form like all of that and i was like and like music directing too and like you're mm. I, i've kind of turned my view into like the daw as like sort of the new manuscript paper I don't have yeah, to, yeah, I don't have yeah. to draw like everything out. I can like, like I was talking about earlier, like I have just like these little like page long, almost like yeah. spark notes mm-hmm. of what a piece could be. And then yeah. I just open up logic or pro tools and I just put it in. And so it's like, and that mm-hmm. kind of going back to Dembski, that was sort of something I learned from him is like, you can take like a really, really small idea yep. 
and get a lot of mileage out of it. Oh, yeah. and, like, and for me, what's cool is that sometimes it'll take me a really long, I've thought about this a lot. Sometimes it'll take me a really long time to write one bar of music or whatever, like a, a section, but I don't often go back and change notes because mm, each note right, that I'm right. putting down, like it's, I almost view it like a puzzle. Like there's only so many choices. And if it's right. like, if it isn't something that I want, then you just break the rule and you just like, that sounds better. And then you just go back. Like, yeah. it doesn't actually matter, but like, it's just, it's for me a way to like start with an idea and then create mm -hmm. from there without yeah. having to like, Oh, what if I do this? What if I do that? And then like kind of erasing and changing. And so it's, that's been fun for me. And that's kind of like musically and like production wise, typically how I think about stuff. However, I have been doing more producing for other people's music. Okay. And that's obviously an entirely different process. Yeah. So actually one thing I think about a lot is what, what production means and how it relates to composition. And, um, I, well, maybe I'll ask you, so how do you view, how do you view production? What do you think it is? <laughs> It's funny because like we had an entire class like just about <laughs> that question. Sorry, right. that's, that's <laughs> li living living in Brooklyn, New York. That so, so sometimes actually part of production is capturing sounds that you would never imagine mm -hmm. using them in ways. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's that's production. Uh, no. Uh, so the way this class started was the and the they po the teachers posed the question what is a music producer? And everyone had to go around and answer that question. Nice. And it's a really interesting question because obviously everyone tries to give like their answer, but ultimately by the time you get around there, the answer is there is no answer. Oh. Music production is like a very, like the way I think about it is mm -hmm. it's like, it's the music director. It's the director of a movie it's the, it's the coach. It's like, it's the person that ultimately, uh, guides uh -huh. the creation of the music. And that can be anywhere from actually writing the music mm -hmm. to just hiring the right person. Yep. To literally giving the money to the people to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's what was cool is like the idea of a, but then there are specific kinds. Like there are the composer minded producers. There are the business minded producers. There are right. the like technical minded producers. And so like, that's what I found, found really cool about it is I think the difference between producing in that sense and like composing mm -hmm. is composing often felt really isolating to me. Cause like when we were doing our stuff, it often was just you in a room with a pencil and a paper and it better be good. And yeah. And then it was like, hopefully someone wants to play this. And then, <laughs> and then it wasn't like, they definitely at, least do in, not. <laughs> at least in logic, it plays it literally right back to you. Oh God, thanks logic. You did it perfectly. And then you can put logic drummer on and it's like, Hey, there's a drummer that played for me now. <laughs> Named Gavin named Gavin and he feels really guilty about his music school experience. <laughs> Dude, Gavin's got problems. Which is a good segue into what I was talking about wanting wanting to talk about was the craft of music making. Yes. yes. Well, I mean this is all related. Uh, yeah. You, like you've brought up a couple things that have sparked ideas for me so far. The Please. The, the first is how uh, pen on paper composition, you know, dots on the page, relates to the more modern style of uh, composing in a DAW, composing for live performance, things like that, um, versus one thing that we talked about in a previous um, podcast, an urtext, right? <laughs> yes. So you, have, you have this document that is the document that everything else <laughs> goes from. Um, which I mean exists a little bit in in recording technology with master tracks and things like that, um, which is kind of an urtext in a way. It is. Um, and then also when you're talking about the the sides of production, how that relates to it, because I often think of a producer as something like an arranger or an orchestrator, something like that. So the 
the producer's job is similar to an orchestrator, but you did bring up the the business minded thing, and then production, especially in in some other areas, like a movie producer, is not really like an orchestrator. It's more like a a business. That's a good. Head. I don't know what a I don't know what a movie producer does other than like I've just can kind of assume that it's yeah you're you're the one in the room like when they're editing and you're helping the director you're you're yeah. like I, like i see myself I think it's your money on the line i think that's the whole like the the producers the musical like yes. you can make more money with a flop than a hit it's it's so you front the money for this this idea so you find somebody who wrote a story and you're gonna front, yep. you're gonna get all the money so that a director can make it happen yep so you're putting yeah, all so your that, risk involved. So yeah, so so even there, you can see like producer in that side of things is different than a music producer Absolutely. because it's like way different. There, yeah, there can be that kind of music producer where you're yeah. just going around investing in yeah. people, and you're getting the music makers to yeah. do that part. You're just yes, you're like the bankroll. Like so, so all of these things like exist, and that's what's really cool about it. And to be perfectly honest with you. It's also a little like I've I've fallen in love with it and have and have wanted to pursue it because it's also a little bit more of a stable side of music mm, in the absolutely. sense that okay, like okay. because this is another thing that's just really unfortunate about music like I don't believe in the music industry today like as it stands <laughs> does, like does anybody. Well, that's what I mean, but I don't think anyone does, but everyone still kind of tries to play the game. Yeah. And because like, what is the alternative? Like, I think provide real value to people. I think that the music industry is dead because it's not providing value to anybody. So nobody cares. Exactly. It's just, it's, it's in its own little circle. It's not doing anything that anybody wants. And that's the part where do you find like, yes, you're entirely right. But where is the value? Uh huh. That's a good question. I would argue, and I've definitely talked to people that also believe this. I think it's, uh, it's experiences. And like yes, that, this absolutely. is already known yep. across like every industry. Like people our age don't care about things. They care about experiences mm-hmm. and mu- what is music. It's like at its like origin, it's like a communal experience. It's magic. <laughs> it's magic it's alchemy it is i think as my favorite my it, favorite way of saying it it's just vibrating air that's, yeah, that's yeah, my, yeah. Uh... <laughs> but you're getting people excited about vibrating air you you're no, you're manipulating illusion. you're you're, you're an, an airbender air. whatever i, I never really <laughs> an airbender i never really I, like watched, that. That was a good I didn't watch avatar but with the little i know about it <laughs> yeah for sure it's an experience you're, you're right you're absolutely right so, and it's funny because like, uh, and even going back to the, the pen and paper thing, because it still relates to uh, the craft because someone who has become, well, I have two recent heroes that we can, all right, sorry, three that we could get into, but the first one is Nadia Boulanger. Okay. Who like you, we had to study about in music history was how like I first learned about her. But I kind of, and that was like, I wanted to be a teacher. I was going to go through and get my doctorate right, and be be the next Daria. Um, (laughs) That was your goal at the time. That was my goal was to be like Daria. Uh, (laughs) And uh, uh, (laughs) yeah, so I wanted to like teach in college. Like I thought that was like my, my thing, but um, uh ultimately like I got away from that. So I just kind of like fell out of sort of like the classical background of things. Like I like to play Beethoven and like, or mess around like reading sheet music and stuff like that. But recently I've just, I've kind of come back into it a little bit more and I forget what I was listening to or she just sort of came up and like her, her whole philosophy of like, like her being for people who don't know, I guess that would be watching. She's like sort of known as the greatest music teacher right of all time Mm -hmm. and unfortunately i guess for better or worse she would have maybe been one of the greatest composers of all time if she hadn't sort of been like shunned because she was like in the same class as like Debussy and novel yep and she ultimately like kind of got robbed out of like that prestigious like if you win that you're basically like the next composer 
Right. And like, there was a lot of controversy around her not winning it. And apparently she just gave up on composing and went into teaching. Wow. And, but then like, she's basically credited with, with, uh, creating or helping found like the American, the like concert American sound uh -huh. because like, I guess back in the day before like Copeland and like Ives and stuff like that, like American music was pretty front, like laughed at yes. in European like audiences and stuff like that, which I didn't necessarily know. Yeah. But I found that interesting, but then people like Aaron Copeland and uh, Bernstein and, Bernstein and like all these people started studying with her, including like Quincy Jones, which I right. think is probably the best segue. Yeah. In that because he's literally, no one would deny Quincy Jones's uh, influence on where music is today. Right. And specifically Michael Jackson oh, and yeah. most specifically the thriller album. Interesting. Cool. Yeah. yeah because I, I would be really interested to know the timeline that he studied with her um and i hope for the sake of pretty old yes so it would have had to have been earlier in his career i would imagine right um so i would assume that he i yeah actually that's 50s a really or good 60s point. that's a really good point because uh so he definitely studied with her like back when he was doing jazz and stuff like right. that i would i would assume so he's had this whole career of like really he's knows music inside and out from like the technical knows species mm -hmm. counterpoint knows figured bass knows mm -hmm. orchestration knows all of these things that we all study yep that have kind of been lost not kind of i would say that like it's i don't work with a lot of musicians that know these things and this is where i want to be really specific wait at careful. all no, no no not at all not at all but species i want to be counterpoint i i buy Yes. But orchestration, I mean, hmm. no, this is, this is, sorry. This is, this is why I wanted to stop okay. and like yeah, yeah. Qual and qualify myself because first, before I go any further, I want to make it very clear that I do not subscribe to the fact that you have to know You're music right. theory yeah. to make Absolutely. quality, worthwhile, valid, and even life-changing music. You, cause you thousand percent don't. But what I thought was, what I think is interesting about Nadia Boulanger and like people like Quincy Jones and really lots of great musical minds, like I think even Frank Zappa, like oh yeah, studied I mean, he was with all her. into Varese and stuff, yeah, yeah. And so like people that were really trying to push the musical bounds and arguably looking back did actually push the musical bounds. Yeah, I think the only reason they did, not the only reason, one of the reasons they did was because they really understood the basic like foundation of Western yeah. music. So what, what do you think about this as an idea? Not, not that you need to understand the foundation or that there even is the foundation, sure. but yeah. that the dedication to a craft is what you need. And so okay, you, don't, yes. you don't have to study species counterpoint, but yes. if, you're, if you're just like pumping out stuff and not thinking about it and not actually paying attention to the artistry of what you're doing, you're not actually going to be um, producing anything that has any sort of long-term value. But somebody like Quincy Jones or Frank Zappa is extremely dedicated to the craft of what they're doing. So it doesn't matter if that craft is species counterpoint or, or jazz harmony or... Um, or something completely different or like yes indonesian gamelan music it doesn't matter <laughs> yes because like jazz harmony is ki has counterpoint in it and voice leading but it's not like species counterpoint and and the way that harmony is treated is extremely advanced and also incredibly different than anything classical like so, I'm but that's, terrible that, at jazz for that that's reason. what's because interesting I can't think like that i've never that's... practiced thinking like that so this is what's really funny. I love species counterpoint. And what I would say is that I would believe that if you truthfully study species counterpoint, you can apply it to jazz yeah. and it makes, and it makes jazz a little bit less scary because like, and it, and it really does. And I actually got really pissed because I took an intro to jazz theory class at, at NYU. NYU. And NYU, and I was like, finally, I'm going to, like, this is what I've been looking for. Someone's going to make this make sense. And I swear to God, the only thing I got out of it is there's no difference. It's really? just how, it's just how the, the bass is voiced or how it's figured. You know what I mean? Like, the harmony is different, 
but the way that the bass, the way that a bass voice and a soprano voice moves yes. still yeah. kind of follows these gen, like things kind want of. to resolve. Yeah, yeah. And that it's might, just that in jazz, you resolve things very differently or you purposefully don't resolve. And I still think like, yeah, because I even think species counterpoint is applied to like larger, like, because like when I go, th when I do things, like when I write stuff down, yep. sometimes I just write like a minor and then like mm -hmm. B minor is like over here. And then there's just like, Yep. some kind of melodic figure and it's not like that's the thing i just know this is kind of an area that i'm in and this is an area mm -hmm. and this is just like three two one yeah ultimately and it's, so it's not something that you hear it's just a way that like helps me like categorize music and i can apply like those little building blocks to jazz so it's mm -hmm. like i don't Absolutely. know how to play I'm not a jazz musician. I would never say that I'm a jazz musician, but I will say that I've learned from jazz music and it definitely gets put into what I do. Well, cause I think the thing with jazz music is at its, at its root, it's triadic and it's functional. So Stravinsky is also, I, really wouldn't you say chromatic though too? No, actually not no. at all. I would say it's less chromatic than classical. Oh, please, music. please talk about that. <laughs> Because I would say that um, the basis of jazz comes yeah. out of functional re resolution. So either like the blues, five, one. one, four, five, one, or two, five, ones, straight yes. two, five, ones. And you can start substituting. And, and so, like, this is all stuff that, like, Liszt was doing and Debussy and stuff. So you can substitute tritone substitutions or third bass substitutions, but the basis is still the 251. The basis is still triadic. Mm -hmm. And so you have sharp 11s. You have crazy extensions, but it's all building off triadic harmony. And, and this is not to say that in the 70s, everything didn't change. Yeah. But the heart, the basis of it is functional. And I would say that... That is where you can tie it to species counterpoint versus like modern day pop music, which I actually don't think is functional. So like a song that's in G major where the chord progression is B minor, G major, D, A minor, something like that. And then it just like loops. three, three, one, five, two or something like that. It just and then loops, it just loops, loops you mean. forever. Yeah, it's, no, what does I, it even mean that it's in G major? It's not functional at all. It's, it's not just, in G major. Yeah, no, I said it's just so. in it's in like it's like in a pan diatonic thing, like any chord in that key works and any note in that key works. And it's just we're just hanging out. OK, in, dude, in, I'm like, so glad you said that, because that's exactly what I do. I just do it not diatonically. Right. You know what I mean? So that's, and actually in terms of something to show you, actually this is so pertinent to, uh, and I, this may be a moment where you have to pause because okay. I right. thought I had it. I, I may have it queued up, okay. but I just need to. <laughs> so or, so is, I can also talk a little while you're, while you're. Yes, please. Up. Yeah, yeah. No, so, please. so would you say that, are you saying that your music is more kind of sitting in this pan diatonic world or maybe like modal or something like that? So back to like what we learned, like yeah. in Dembski, like a tone, I don't think in key signatures, I think right. about pitch collections. Nice. Okay. So that pitch collection could be, could sound like G major, B yep. minor, A minor, whatever. But ultimately what you're hearing is like G up to uh, F or F sharp. And it's like all white. It's like the G major scale technically, uh -huh. but I'm not thinking about one to three to, or one to minor three to right. minor. It's, it's two. not functional. You, you don't have functional harmony. No, but you do have intervals so and you I'm... have different ways of stacking them. Yeah. And then certain ones have like this, I kind of identify a tonic and a dominant and like sort of use it okay so there is some uh, function in there and so i try to create function with it i guess yeah, is what i would say i love it yeah. yes. well, th this has been that was my experiment for years about non-diatonic collections but building functionality which is essentially what stephen dembski's project at least in part was with like the constellations system. thing absolutely yeah. That that the the tonal system has this intrinsic power because of its hierarchy and its function system, 
but he liked the sound of 12 tone music and Dalla Piccola. So is there a way to get these, these sounds of different types? Like seemingly okay. super random stuff to not be random. To feel functional, to feel like it makes sense. And like it has movement. Cause that's, that's the having hierarchy allows you to have motion versus true 12 tone music has this kind of stagnant feel because everything's equal. So it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. Yep. I remember we were analyzing a Dalla Piccola piece in uh, in the composition one or two. I don't remember which class it was, but uh, I remember I had this realization where it's like, is it just the same thing over and over again the whole time? And then Dembski was like, I don't know. Is it? Keep going. Do the whole piece. And it was. It was literally just the same pitch class set, you know. Up and down is the same as side to side. And so, like, it sounds cool, but after, like, three minutes, you're like, well, what now what? What are we doing? So can I, can I tell you something that's so interesting, though, about pitch class? I, like, for example, if, we, if, if, he, ever, if he really did, because sometimes he would do this, but if he gave us a test of, like, identify the pitch classes yep. and then show all of their inversions and whatever the canonical, canonical transformations. Yep. I don't think I would do super great on the those tests. And further, I didn't I never got perfect grades in species counterpoint. Mm. And so this is my next step that I'll take with species counterpoint. It's the, the Baroque style is not relevant to us anymore. Right. So like those rules, like and the reason those rules happened was because their ears thought like that was what they were used to, and that's what felt right. A tritone right. just felt gross. So hit it and then resolve. Like, don't sit on it. Just let it let it happen and, and move on. Right. Now that we've heard jazz, we've heard, like, all sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, you can just hang out in there all day. Yeah, dissonance is cool. And then there's... <laughs> cool. and, then, and then you don't have to resolve it the way that species no. counterpoint says you have to. Yep. So what I end up doing is just, like... But it's cool to know, like, what is an upper neighbor? What is a lower neighbor? What is passing motion? What is a suspension? Because those things still apply regardless of the rules you're quote Absolutely. unquote like following. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean about like Quincy Jones understood species counterpoint because Nadia Boulanger made him do it at nauseum right. until he couldn't do it anymore. Like that was her thing was like, you need to know the alphabet so well. Right. And then I promise you one day when I let you go, when you've sort of pleased me enough, then you were really going to get something out of it. I don't want to be like that. I think that's, not, I, that's what I don't like about classical music, but I still think the, yeah, I, I, I do have a passion about like trying to bring that information to people. Cause it's not as scary. I think people are so afraid of music theory because people just throw numbers and they throw like fancy words like mixolydian and like all of this stuff. When truthfully, I just, I love thinking about it from zero to 11. That's it. Ah, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you have 12 pitches and it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, T, E. And I've used that ever since because obviously you can't have 11 and you can't have 12. That doesn't. Yeah. I think you can have 10. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so speaking of that, um, what you just mentioned about the, the making him do it over and over again until he couldn't do it anymore and, and disliking that about classical music um i've kind of had a a big shift in my teaching philosophy yeah because i used to think you teach people how rather than what yep and i i'm completely flipped now i think you don't tell people how at all i think or as little as possible you let them figure that out because they'll start to come up with their own understandings. So I've been doing this even more with my students is just what, this is what it is, play it. And then they say, how? And I go, just copy me, just play what I played. And then if they play it wrong, be like, nope, nope, just copy me. And they'll figure out, and they'll actually learn faster that way. Because they, because they don't have to focus on anything else than just like what it no, is. And they build a rule set in their own mind and they start to make their own connections versus I say, no, here's the connection to make here. Here's how these two chords are connected. Here's how these two chords are connected. I just say these are the two chords. It sounds like that one goes to that one, huh? <laughs> Why do you think that is? It looks like only one of those fingers is moving. That's right. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like they only move by one right. of those little So just a, maybe a little yeah. bit, but I try, and, I try and teach how way less than I used to. 
And so that's where that repetitive. That's such a good. Just I'm do so the species glad that counterpoint. you said that. And oh, you did it wrong. Do it again. And I let you figure out what's wrong about it. <laughs> and then my job is so much easier. No, no actually, it's true, though, it's true. So that my philosophy is a little bit similar, and or like I've shifted a little bit too because I kind of grew out of like I did not like teaching, and it was simply because I was teaching like beginning piano students and their young children that hate the piano and i was a kid that hated the piano so i couldn't like there's nothing i could say huh? yeah there's nothing, i know i'm like yeah i know right and like your <laughs> your parents aren't helping me so i'm just sitting here like yeah. babysitting you and like if the parents don't make you practice yeah. i'm gonna sit here and teach you the same lesson every week you're gonna hate it it's gonna get worse and worse and then your yeah. parents are gonna think i'm a bad teacher but i'm i'm not gonna be here to like blow balloons and like that's just not yeah fun and i think that kid also could probably do something maybe more productive yeah with their with their time so but when you teach people that are like really like interested in music it's a fun easy experience because my thing is I want to teach you how to teach yourself. Right. Because like, and what we've all learned now, especially through the pandemic is you can learn a lot of shit through the internet. Like true. if you really want to look and you really want to spend the time and develop a craft, the mm-hmm. information right. is a thousand percent out there. Oh yeah. But, but what is the problem? There is too much information. Mm-hmm. Someone who does already know what they're doing can help point you to the right information Absolutely. and yep. help connect different bridges. And like, cause I just like taking things and breaking them down very simply, kind of like you're saying yep. the species. And I didn't think about it this way. Species counterpoint is one of those things where there are simple rules. Mm-hmm. There are not a lot of them just yep. follow them. And it's kind of like a, it's a musical puzzle, like yep. just yeah, make yeah, something exactly. sound good and don't, and like, Oh, you broke the rules. Nope. Go back. And it's like, that's not music. Of course, that's not music. Right. But like when you do that enough times, it's like you, you do, you hear like, oh, parallel motion does only sound good to a point. Or it's funny when you like land on an octave and go away from it. Like there, you just notice different things that will like, I think subconsciously like go yep. into your music. And that's what, yeah, like Quincy Jones, when he wrote Thriller, I don't think he was thinking about, or like when he produced that, I don't think he was thinking about Species Counterpoint. But maybe he was, yeah, actually, that is so not fair because I think about Species Counterpoint all the time. So maybe, yeah, that's even fair there is that like even something as simple as like a repeating baseline, Mm -hmm. just because something repeats does not mean it's bad. Yeah. Like, look at there's Philip Glass. Most people like love his music. That tests the amount of times that one could repeat things. So, uh, yeah, like that's that's the kind of stuff. And like, just to get back to it is like the idea of like clicking and dragging samples in and building a whole song without knowing even what key it is in is I think, or you know what key it's in because you have to make sure all the samples you line up are in G minor or (laughs) like, you know what I mean? And like, I also don't want to just, I'm not casting a value judgment because what I believe is if that gets you creating music, if that gets you into it, that's Mm -hmm. awesome. But I think like you said earlier is like, if that doesn't make you want to go further and understand like, what is that sample? And then you just have a little like cheap keyboard and you just, Oh wait, I think that's the note. Mm -hmm. And like, and then all of a sudden now you're like, wait, instead of like trying to click and drag through all these like samples, what if I just play that like quick little repeated pattern. And now, now I've made that repeated pattern. And then the next step is like, wait, maybe I could just play this all the way through or I could like Mm -hmm. do. So it's like, there is this progression of like, it's not samples aren't bad. It's a whole art form to like, use samples but what but did like jay dilla or like kanye do they just like go to splice click and drag and like okay okay <laughs> i'm good <laughs> like I mean, I you know. can make a lot of really really cool sounding I know. music i know like I've, heard that. I've heard it i think there's an awesome i've done problem, it i've but, done it <laughs> yeah there's a there's a whole there's a whole maybe <laughs> different different conversation maybe that's Au- fair authorship and intellectual property are like these ideas drive me crazy. Like, <laughs> I'm up at night thinking about these. Things. 
that is a whole that is a yeah. whole other conversation. but actually i want to i want to hear your music we're gearing up fuck i know i i'm sorry that the conversation was too uh because the, the problem <laughs> is is like i'm i'm on we're teasing everybody I know. I'm sorry. I'm gonna hear Max this is why. This is why I said it was definitely much better to uh, <laughs> to cut. But let's see. Um, I'm pretty sure. Bro, this is... <laughs> yes. Okay. So I just, this, I'm pulling up the Pro Tools one. session right now. Nice. So this is one that you started. It's just a little bit, a little bit you wrote out on paper, and then. So this is a fun, I'll get all Pro Tools. Yes, I'll give like just the quick. Um, oh wait, I'll give like the quick where it came from. So like okay. I in, at NYU, like I've um, I'm not shy or like quiet about like my wanting to like be atonal, like quote unquote. So I like tell people like why and like whatever. And I one of the kids in my like songwriters forum class or whatever which is like a collaboration class you write songs throughout the semester he was like a operatic like tenor i think he was a vocal performance like major and he was a tenor so like cool. powerhouse voice and we wrote a couple songs together and he was super open about like the atonal like mm -hmm. stuff so we did some interesting things we hadn't spoken like in a long time and he just like hit me up one day and he sent me this he's like hey like I remember like you talking about like making your own scales like that one time and like I kind of just stumbled upon this thing and I was curious and so I'm just going to send it to you and what it essentially sounded like to me was the only way I can describe it is like an octatonic blues scale. Mm. So it was like it was like two halves of a blues scale and I, it's not I'm just saying generally it was yeah. like two halves of a blues scale but like separated in a just so they were offset that it was like, it did feel like a complete cool. scale, but it felt like two halves of a blues thing. So he just wrote that out to me on paper. Mm -hmm. And I was like, let's apply some function to it. Cool. So ultimately I just take those notes. And if you hit one and skip one and hit the other one and skip yeah, one, what is that? <laughs> That's a triad, right? <laughs> yeah. And then you figure the other ones that you didn't hit, that's yep. the other triad. So like, depending on how many notes you're using, that's how many like chords, like I would typically start with. Yep. So I just put those notes in my left hand and then I take my right hand and just mess around on those notes and try to come up with a melody. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately I did that on piano. I then, by recording with my iPhone, I then went to, uh, dropped it into Pro Tools, and then I went to my drums, and I now have a couple microphones, plus I then record my iPhone simultaneously. And I basically just, like, comped myself, which I do, like, which I've been doing more and more recently, which has been kind of fun. Uh -huh. um, so without further ado, hopefully this Here, can just you, plays. Can you share, share sound? Let me see. That? Unfortunately, so I'm, I've pulled this up oh, on my desktop. I see. This I is see. the problem. Okay. So I'm hoping that the speakers... All right, yeah, yeah. Well, let's try it. Let's try it. So here, let, let's do one thing. Let's do one thing in uh, on your laptop that it'll help the audio. Me do something? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you're in Zoom, if you go down yeah. to where it says mute, there's a little carrot. And if you click yes. on that, one of the options is audio settings. Um, yes. Uh, so if you uncheck, automatically adjust microphone volume. Okay. Because then Zoom won't turn it down if it thinks it's noise. And then select suppress background noise to low, if that's an option. Got it. Okay. Hell yeah. That should help. Did I change input volume at all? Uh, no. I... Okay. But automatically adjust what Zoom will do. It's really weird. Anybody listening can learn this about Zoom. Honestly, I want to hear what you have to say about Zoom audio because it baffles me. So yeah. continue. Well, because what it'll do is it actually turns down the main uh, input on your computer. If it, uh -huh. hears, uh, if it hears too much <clears throat> music. And so I've had things where I've had lessons where I'm just getting quieter and quieter and quieter throughout the lesson. Yep. Okay, I'm All hoping. Right. Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> Slinky. Yes. Thank you. 
Thanks, man. I, but I just thought that's funny because I often, if something's like super weirdly uh, dissonant, I oftentimes like ending with like something super like uh, <laughs> diatonic and like tonic. Yeah. Dude, I, I loved it. That was great. Thanks, I, man. I, uh, it's interesting because sort of the, the, the superficial structure of it, it, it almost sounds like lounge music. It really like there was so no because like this is another thing that I like to do and it's kind of like the craft of music for me like starts it, it's kind of synonymous now with recording mm. because like that's such almost like that is probably one of the largest ways that music is consumed I would have to imagine if not right. by far the largest is recorded music mm -hmm. um and one thing I really love, and not only, and I guess another thing I should have mentioned, it's not so much just music theory um, as much as it is also music history. Like that's another thing that I've really loved about studying music is like I've kind of now switched a little bit think, and saying that understanding music history is almost maybe a little bit more important than music theory in my uh -huh. opinion. Because it kind of goes hand in hand. It kind of goes hand in hand. Like music is changing because of like tip, like culture changing. Like yeah. is sort of uh, we take a class at NYU, which is the history of songwriting, and essentially it's just the history of uh, of American history from nineteen fifty. I see. I see. 1980 and then 1980 to two thousand four. It's interesting. They start songwriting in nineteen fifty because songwriting goes back like. Well, because as long it, as people, <laughs> exactly. But but it is like our 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 program is a is a like contemporary music. I see. I see. Yeah. Commercial music thing. So it's like we start with Hound Dog. That's the class is. Uh, I'm sure you might love and Hound Dog. Okay, whose version of Hound Dog do they do? Well, of course, we study exactly where it came from. So okay. we're not. It's not El. It's not Hound Dog by Elvis Presley. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, because like Big Mama Thornton's version is so different. Yeah, it's no, funny and that's, to listen to the two of them, and then you hear Elvis, and you're like, "Whoa, this sucks!" They like so song this zero so bad. So wait, so so this class, it's one of the best classes I've ever taken. It was actually the reason I wanted to go to NYU specifically yeah. was I saw they they taught this songwriting history. And I was like, okay. we spent so much time studying the dead white guys that okay. I was like, it's I would love to see what this is like. So like, I'm not a songwriter, but fuck it, I'll I'll write a song and. <laughs> I'll, I'll send my I'll send my classical stuff and hopefully that gets their attention and like so I got in, um, but yeah I was really excited for that and so and the class is called fourteen songs so they, the time period was nineteen fifty to nineteen eighty and the two teachers take pick fourteen songs that they deem change the course of music history over that time period mm -hmm. and so the big thing about the class is and like the hard slash fun part for them is deciding like. Yeah, because you could imagine it. How the how do you pick fourteen songs? So yeah, there's something super arbitrary about it. Of course, and like they know that. So it's like you're studying other things around it yeah. and other songs and things. And why did this song do as well as it did? 
And mainly you're just looking at the culture and then you realize like why I'm so happy that like rock and stuff is coming back is because like, and punk it's like, ultimately that's music only really changes underground. And then like, and then people find out about it and then it becomes commercialized. And then the next generation comes and does these things underground. And there's this, you can really like follow this, like, ebb and flow and it's it's just kind of a cultural yeah truth it seems like um but my most fascinating thing that i've learned and this is the second of the heroes that i was talking about uh potentially getting into is glenn johns do you know that name Mm -mm. so everyone knows george martin right uh from the beatles like the producer of the beatles and uh he's basically like one of the other dudes in the room Oh, he, okay. He was he was instrumental in the Rolling Stones early in their career. Uh, Steve Miller band, like you you name it, like he was typically one of the recording engineers, and he was most famous for his drum recording technique. Okay, which is as I've told you, I've recorded drums with my iPhone pretty much ever since I've been trying to record because that was the first and only microphone that I had. Right. Apple does some wild things and it's a really interesting, highly, highly, highly compressed microphone that makes some cool sounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I was in my production class and I was just failing to get the drum sound that I needed for this like kind of rock like section. And I just thankfully had gotten kind of gifted and then bought one microphone during a great uh, Black Friday sale. And so I had two microphones. I had two, I had a close mic, a room mic, and an iPhone. Cool. What the Glenn Johns mic recording technique is a close mic, uh, and essentially like a bass drum snare mic, a close mic, and a room mic. Not and an you, iPhone. Just, and you, not an iPhone. Definitely not an iPhone. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I have a funny story to get into that, uh, why this is coming up. But you just put them in basically almost an arbitrary place he like there's a little bit of a madness to the thing but you just get something close to the bass drum you get something just off to the right basically where like the floor tom is Uh and then you get uh, essentially something right above and behind which is like this basically that's the drum sound and then you just get a little bit of control and a little bit of control over the bass drum by putting that there Right, so essentially yeah. you're not close miking really anything, but you're yeah. getting this like pretty cool stereo image of mm-hmm. the drummer. And so in this class, it was a zoom class because it was pandemic. And this guy messages me, he's like, Hey, you should look up like how Glenn Johns does it. And so ever since then I've been doing that. And that's this, the way you hear the drum sound is these two microphones plus the iPhone. And then I just mix them in and what's interesting is it almost acts as its own reverb yeah. and EQ at the same time because yeah. Yeah, yeah. because the microphones pick up a very different yes. part of the yeah. frequency yeah. spectrum. And by compressing them, like there's all sorts of cool stuff you can do post-processing with them. But because I've been hyper aware of like getting trying to get as good of sound at source as I possibly can, Mm -hmm. because I was lucky enough to be able to take a mixing class with uh, Kevin Killen, who's one of the teachers at NYU. And he's like one of the like mixing, producing, like recording engineer, like legends, like Mm -hmm. David Bowie, like all these like crazy people. It's one thing that like, You can say some, whatever you want about NYU, but they definitely have some crazy people that we get, mm-hmm. we're fortunate to learn from. And his thing is like, you should, you should be able to do a whole mix in less than like, in no more than eight plugins and not eight, with eight instances or eight total. I guess eight total, but because like, what if you have like an EQ on every channel or something? So that's what I'm saying. You So what he does is he takes everything and sums everything to a vocal bus, a music bus, and a drum bus. Okay, so he doesn't he doesn't do a whole lot with individual channels. No, well, but, and that's the thing is because what he says is that you should do everything you can mm-hmm. to get the sound that you want 
at the source. So that once it goes into, it is recorded, mm -hmm. the processing that you have to do should of be course, very of course. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but you're also, not always in that great of a situation. Most times you're not. And so that's where it's like Kevin, Ke like he gives us these homework assignments, which they're actual songs that he's produced. Uh -huh. And uh, that's wonderful. It was incredible. But you hit play and you're like, what do I need to do to this? This sounds amazing. And like you just hit play and everything. Like, What if you just turned it in as what as is? You're like, I think it's good, man. <laughs> That, honestly, he he may have even I don't know what he would have done, but he might it, it could have been like a, you passed the test. Like actually that's what the version was. There was no mixing. <laughs> That'd be funny. No, yeah, but I learned I, I, I learned I a lot mixing something. Wait, sorry, keep going. So well no, I was just saying I learned a lot from that. And what I learned mostly is like go back to the what how did you record a song in nineteen fifty? Mm-hmm. Did you open up your laptop and have like infinite tracks that you could choose from and like all these synthesizers at the tip? Of, like you didn't have any, you had a microphone and some baller musicians in a room. You hit record and hopefully the tape didn't tear when you did it. Right. And like, like, so how, and, and that tape was expensive. So you had to be great at your instrument. You had to know your songs. You had to have people that were incredibly competent, if not masters at yep. their craft. And they're making really, really, really simple music. Yeah. Like really simple music. Yeah. But it's like, it's some of the greatest recordings of all time are like that. And what, oh, yeah. and now we care about like hiss in a recording. Right. I like, I just, it's like, to me, it's so unimportant. And like, and so I'm really trying to kind of go back to this, like learn, I think analog like has to come back. That's like ultimately like, like I've, I've like, I've grown a new passion right. for like, it's so expensive and it's so like hard to do, but like, did you, do you know, like when they would mix records back in the day, you had to like perform the mix. Like everyone would like be oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, have yeah, like right, three right. people and be like, yeah, these are yeah. your four faders. That's your four faders. Yeah. You hit play. And then it's like, Oh fuck. I fucked up. Okay. Like start over. Let's like, just be really careful with the tape. All right. And then like, hopefully we get it. Otherwise that's like $5,000, like whatever it is like down the drain. Yep. And then you get fired yeah. and your career's over. But <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I mean, I think, I think there's a real value problem. And I think that essentially recorded music has ruined the fact that music has value because it, it's kind of in line with, I don't know if you followed any of like the NFT conversation or whatever. Oh man, I'm curious to know your thoughts. But an, but... an urtext is kind of an attempt at an NFT, right? Sure. Yeah. Because it's saying that this, this is... There's this really only thing. one of them. Yeah. Right. And, and so a master track is another attempt, but these are a little bit false. Right, because yes. that's not where the music is. The music exists in in the shared space between a performer and a listener. Yeah, right. Whether that's an ear, whether that's an earbud or like an actual like stage and whatnot. Exactly. And so, if if you go back to 1750, there's no earbuds. It has to yeah. be on a stage or in a crowd on in the town square or whatever. That's the only way to make it happen. And so, uh, that that is kind of an NFT too, because you can't record it either. An experience, yes. It, it has to be an experience. And so it has value because it's inherently super scarce. Yes, yes. And now there, like, there's no scarcity at all. And so I think like when you're saying like getting rid of hiss, everybody is fighting to try and create value out of something that has no value anymore. And so that's like your, your vinyl thing. Let's make it scare. You know, we'll print we'll print fifty vinyl or or analog or whatever. We'll we'll record it onto analog. We'll do something. You know, so it has value. But it, if you put it on Spotify, you're it doesn't have any value. It doesn't. Yeah, exactly. Like, why would I pay twenty bucks for this thing that I could get that sounds like it, I could even choose the resolution that I get to hear it back yeah. at? Right. Oh, wait, this one's in Dolby Surround? Wait, let me play that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me okay. listen to it on my not surround speakers. This is right. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think that that's that's the problem is that we're trying to squeeze value out of something that has no value anymore. 
Yeah, no, that's super true. And I think, and I'm glad you brought it back to 1750 because this has like been my dilemma is like people, rich people used to just straight up pay talented people to do their talented, like to do their yeah. stuff. They because they sometimes were, still. Sometimes, yeah, like residency, like that's yeah. the dream. Like, I don't know how you get them, but that's cool. Yeah. Um, I think, <laughs> um, like, I think Dembski even, like, he had that thing where it was, like, he went to, like, Switzerland or something like that and just lived for a month. And I think he wrote that, like, pterodactyl piece or something, which was that. He felt uh, just like Haydn. He was like, I've made it. <laughs> this is it. I mean, I was like, I want to do that. But then it's yeah. like, damn, no one no one is throwing that money like that. I mean, obviously, yeah, there are few, few and far between. But it was because they valued it they valued it just straight up and it was like we would rather have bach like work for us and create these masterworks while like like whatever and it was like so it was just that was the way and then their consumer would literally have to learn the piano to play the music to know what it sounded like because they probably didn't have enough money to Talk go about scarce <laughs> like, ima like imagine that kind of move what if i said i'm putting out an album but like everybody has to look. Well, Beck did that, right? He put out an album that was just sheet music. Oh my God. Wait, what? Did, I don't know why I don't know about this. And so, uh, in order to hear the album, you have to learn how to play it. Oh, that's so baller. It is, but it, the problem is it's all a gimmick now because it's. Of all course. Made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it, it, that's more like a social commentary than it is like, oh, that's, that's great. But like. Uh, no, so I think I think it goes back to what you're saying about experience. So like I play in a lot of cover bands in Austin or, or like wedding bands or something like that. And those bands make a lot of money and people pay <laughs> a lot of money. But but those bands have to be really, really good. Like yeah. wedding bands for for expensive weddings are amazing. And like yes. they play solos note for note. Dude, that's how the Every, Beatles it's, became it's amazing. Flawless. Right, exactly. And like they show up and they look really good and it's fun and everybody's dancing and like they're yep. providing value to that crowd. Yep. Versus some versus the this is the problem is composers sitting in in music departments are like all pissy about the fact that nobody likes it. It was like, "Well, do something <laughs> valuable." <laughs> But and it's not yes. even just it's not even just classical composers. This is true of like pop producers and stuff too. It's like, well, do something that somebody wants to pay you for. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, dude. No, it's that that's that really is the thing. And so like that's that's kind of why uh with a couple with a couple like classmates, colleagues of mine at school we're in the process of um, putting together basically like a student like exec board mm -hmm. because like one thing that has upset me about New York in general, and I'm, I'm really curious to know what, what Austin is like. Uh, I've experienced a lot of like tunnel vision mm -hmm. out here when it comes to artists, like, cause like I'm in a really unique and I think, good position in the sense that I don't want to be an artist. Like that's not right. on my goal. Yeah. I don't, I don't need people to like, like whatever. Like I love being in like the, like behind the scenes and like that just is, um, uh, yeah, like that, that's my skill set. Um, sorry. I just like, <laughs> I lost my train of thought, uh, um, for oh, a second, New York. Yes. Tunnel vision. So yeah, that was my own tunnel vision right there. <laughs> so, uh, when I was throwing like these events or like doing these parties and trying to create some kind of community, I was largely like putting these things on like by myself and they were always really cool events. Like I would do dinner parties and they'd have be like jam sessions mm -hmm. and it was always like musical people or some kind of creative. Right. And like there are people that I still see like through social media that are like working together today because, and they met like in my apartment. Awesome. I didn't meet any of those people. I guess I did like reach out to some of them via social media, mm -hmm. but like I never, I, I'm cause we mentioned, I think social media came up briefly yeah, or even yeah. before we started. 
I'm really questioned, like, what is the value of social media? Because I look back, I look back on my opportunities and jobs that I've gotten and things that have been positive in my musical life. And I would almost venture to say that I didn't get any of those opportunities thanks to Instagram. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I really like, I'd have to like really do a hard deep dive. Like there's obviously people that you'll get connected to through Instagram like that, that will definitely happen. But the conversion rate of those connections is super poor. Yep. Um, versus shaking someone and looking them in the eye, it's a completely different experience (laughs) and it leaves a different like impression, I think in, in, in people's minds. And so one thing that this like exec board like wants to do is create opportunity for those experiences, because I Mm -hmm. super agree with you. I've been talking about this for a while and most, a, a lot of people I talk to agree streaming isn't going away. Right. And I don't know why you're willing to spend thousands of dollars to record music that is almost guaranteed to make yes. zero money. Bad investment, for sure. Whereas you could spend your time rehearsing maybe songs you hate, and you have just a nice little paycheck every <laughs> whatever. Exactly. And then you can do your podcast, you can have your band, you Absolutely. can like... yep. And so that's been a thing of mine is like, I've really been trying to find stability and because it's like, without it, like you just, Mm -hmm. I can't create. And I think there's also a little bit of like a false illusion of like the starving artist of like, you have to struggle to like make it kind of thing. And I think that gets like glorified maybe a little bit. Yeah. Whereas like, all I know is once I started taking, prioritizing my health, fitness and sleep, a lot of other things got a lot better. Nice. And love also, it. and also like, I do have like a really awesome like day job that I love doing, Good. which is like, it's in food and also at the space, we do like events and stuff. And I'm also planning on doing a musical food event. Cool. Bigger. So like th- this kind of, this comes full yeah, circle yeah. Mm-hmm. in the sense of like, w- if you put music and food and people in a room together, <laughs> not very you just got to get the people the music okay. and the food in the room and the rest really truthfully takes care of itself right and the whole thing is to create a network and to ultimately make money off and with each other because yes. like, this is and like artists don't like talking about it but like i'm we need like no one's going to give you value you have to provide it and you why have to why would you want to do something that provides no value why would you want to do something with no value i don't get it i understand <laughs> wanting to i understand believing that what you do has value i get that but why would you be anti creating value that makes no sense to me <laughs> i yes i agree like i you. believe in my band i think that actually we have something very special and we have to work on figuring out how to convince other people of that that's a salesman that's the job of a salesman that's great that's what you need if i'm like no we're not worth anything it's like well, then why would i invest my own time in it what kind of an idiot would you have to <laughs> no dude like you're super true and like but here's the thing also growing up as musicians and especially as trained musicians we are conditioned to do things for free and we're told to say yes to everything because you have to because i also am kind of coming around around to think that i think it is true i think you do have to just do things for free initially and and i actually the crazy thing is is like my professors like kevin killen who is like a legend a living legend he like because we've i talked about this like how do you like go about establishing your rates and ultimately raising your rates and things like that and and he's like i mean honestly it changes every time like it changes upon the situation like of course i know there are people like me and other like there are people like me and other people in my situation we still do stuff like for free sometimes if we really really believe in the project and in fact they say most of the time the stuff they do for the least amount of money is what they enjoy doing the most because like, and he would say that the, and actually he even took it further and said the mo- the biggest paycheck he ever made was the thing he's like least proud of and like sure. hates. Them. I mean, I, I can see how that would happen. I think, yeah. I think there's a couple things I think, and we should probably play soon. 
we should yes. jam a little bit. But uh, yeah. I think um, I wish that people were more comfortable being open about what they make on things. I think it would help all of us as artists in sort of the bottom and the middle for uh, wages to be transparent. We're not hiding from each other because I think us hiding that from each other helps the people at the top pay certain people less than other people. I think it's, I'm just going to be uh, hilarious here for a sec and say that was one of Donald Trump's uh, policies for uh, prescription medication was, sure. or it, it wasn't even, and it was actually also hospital services. Mm-hmm. They, Absolutely. He, there should be an itemized receipt of how did that one surgery cost $25,000. Yep. They don't have to tell you. They yep. literally yeah. do they not have, have to, to tell, tell you. you. If they're charging you, they should have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so no, that's, I've never thought about that. That's, that's something that's very interesting. But it's like, it's something I've noticed working in like pit pits for musical theater things. Everybody well, cause that's unionized, right? Right. And but like people negotiate different different wages and stuff. And I think then musicians are all like hush hush with each other. And we don't that, talk about just, money. It just serves the contractor because then the <laughs> get away with paying some people less versus if the other guitar player was like, oh, you're getting paid 140. I'm only getting paid 110. What the hell? Why? Yeah. <laughs> And 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 then maybe like, that other guitarist provides thirty dollars more value. That's but that's another. but that's a good conversation to have. That's like yeah. something that everybody should know. This should be transparent. Yes. No, and I, like I, it's I, hard. And business brilliant. conversations are hard. But like, hey man, like you mess up a lot. So like, this is an opportunity for you. Take it or leave it. Hey, I want to take lessons from you. How much do you charge? Me? I I'm just like I'm, I'm being like that because like I actually just had that conversation uh, yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And it's like, and I don't teach regularly and it mm-hmm. actually entirely depends on what it is that you need from me. Sure, um, sure. Because sure. if you want to do a zoom lesson, which I a thousand percent prefer because I want to teach you how to yep. teach yourself. And if we could supplement, maybe I come to your house every now and then to yep. make sure your technique is all right. Like that's a complete, like for me to drive to wherever you are and spend the oh, energy and yep. time to teach you in person, which you're also going to get more value out of. I'm going to charge you less for a Zoom lesson, obviously. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, so the, no, the the transparency. Yeah, so it's just like that's the thing because like I'm trying to think like sixty dollars an hour is pretty standard, like a lot of places. But it's I like charge well, eighty. But you should charge eighty. Congratulations, yeah. thank you. And that's another thing. Like I wanted, I've wanted to go up to seventy five because it's like now I have a master's, like whatever. And I'm New York, also, man. And there, there's ways of providing value. So one thing I do with my students is I'll I'll organize uh, master classes, like yes. master classes, so they can play for each other and practice. That's and really cool. Because that was That's... something I loved about college, and I don't yes. do it all the time. I do it like once a month, once every couple months, because I don't have time yeah. to do it all the time. But yes, but it's a way of adding value to the lessons so that I can justify charging more. Yeah. No, that's, that's super great. And that's what I mean is like, I, I, I'm not pro- teaching like this person came out of blue, out of the blue right. and was like, Hey, like I want to take lessons. I'm like, well, I'm not going to say no to the money. Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like, typically it's like, it, like there's someone like, if you're coming to me and like, I know like, yep. like they're, you're someone that wants to learn. And then if I only have to like help you, cause here's the best part about like teaching you to teach yourself. I don't care if you didn't practice. Because right. I don't, I'm not like, that's your, okay. Now let's just, let's, let me help you learn how to practice. Yep. I love teaching people how to practice Yep. because what is that? You're actually practicing while you're doing that. Mm-hmm. Fun yes. fact. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so gotcha. You just practiced. Gotcha. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh man. I was trying not to practice. <laughs> but yeah, man, I know we've been talking for a while. So like, yeah, I want to play I'm, a little bit. Let's play. Was there anything you wanted to cover? Anything like anything? Okay. Last thing, because I did mention three heroes, the last one, and this will be good. This is kind of a good, uh, send off. Glenn Gould has become my, I love it. Yes, yes, yes. I have seen every freaking YouTube video that is available. (laughs) What what an amazing douchebag. Dude, in a good way, in a way that I in love. the best way possible. Like, I think <laughs> like I, I hope this is OK to say, but like, I feel like he may have legitimately been on the spectrum. Probably. At least. Yeah, yeah. Like he was definitely like a recluse. He was the most social recluse that like I think may have existed because he's so wonderfully assertive. Like 
in, in not an aggressive way, just like so uh, unapologetic like, and like, like no, and this it's is how like, it is, and you're wrong. Sorry, <laughs> prove me wrong. Like I'm willing to have a conversation, but like I'm, I think I'm right. I'm pretty, yeah. I'm right. Yeah, no, and it's, but he is right. Like if yeah. you like, that's what's amazing about looking back is like he's almost been like a musical like Nostradamus or whatever that mm. dude's name is, and specifically to what we've been talking about, he said. He hopes to God that people aren't pay- playing Stravinsky in like 50 years yeah. or like whatever. And, and this dude is like, why? Why not? And he's like, <laughs> I bet he said it's just like that too. <laughs> but Mr. Wow. Gould, why? Why would you say something so absurd? He's like, well, because it would be a museum piece. Like, and it was like, wow. Yeah. But and to be like, fair, I- he was playing Brahms and Mozart and Bach. Of course. Of course. But he was all. Also playing it that in a way that was pissing all of these people off because like you can't play it that way. And he's like, well, I just did. What do you mean I can't? <laughs> <laughs> what a ridiculous thing to say. What is Brahms gonna say about it? He's been dead for like thirty years. Yeah, like, and in fact, if he heard it, he'd probably like, damn, I didn't think about that. That was cool. Yeah. Like it's so no that that's that's also informed a lot because he also like in these interviews talked about like recording was just becoming a thing. Mm-hmm. And like engineers were getting upset because he his humming and like singing along with his playing would sneak into the recording. And yeah. funny enough, my favorite drummer is Elvin Jones, and he was also famous for yeah. grunting and all of that in his recordings. But so yeah, he he definitely uh, those who was the first? It was Glenn Johns. Uh, oh, Nadia Boulanger. Yep, Glenn Johns and Glenn Gould. Those are that's a good three people to. I love uh, that. To study for for people out there that may not know. Yeah. Also, what I loved about this conversation is that we didn't explain half the things we talked about. We just talked about it. I'm that on this true. new thing about have your audience come to you. Don't, yes. don't over explain. I feel like our first couple of episodes we explained a lot. Yes. And I think yes. we, we just talked because that's what I we did. I did think about that in my head a couple of different times. I was yeah. like, we're no, definitely out there. They can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, if, if they even care, if there was value in it, and if exactly. there wasn't, it's yep. fine. I had a good time. Yeah. All right. Let's let's play. I'm gonna grab my. I, I have to plug. I have to plug back in. Tune it. That's the other thing. Like I love because I I don't. I obviously hear snippets of you playing the banjo, um, via social media and whatnot, um. But whenever I see banjo, and I think when anyone, when almost everyone sees banjo, they already, wow, they already hear the sound of the instrument like yeah. uh, in their head. But do, do you play standard banjo tuning? Uh, yeah. Well, yes. So I, this one I have in double C tuning. So there's two different main tunings. There's an open G chord, and then there's double C, which I like more for like modal playing and scale stuff. Uh huh. So it's G, C, G, C, D. So it's like a C9 chord. Interesting. Okay, yeah. I hear that. Chord, chords are harder. you got to do weird stretches to get a lot of chords, but it's really good. Good for melodic playing. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and that's, that's what's interesting about uh, after... Like I said, getting better with um, what's it called? Uh, standard tuning and stuff. I've now started to see why standard tuning exists and how it works. What I still really want to do, what I want to explore in my lessons more, is still being because, like, I can hear the intervals, mm-hmm. but I can't. So I'm reacting to what I'm playing as opposed to like planning. Oh, I see. For me, so for me, seeing major and minor seconds is like still impossible. It like yeah. still well because well, you have to cross strings to make them easy to play, uh, like like a harmonic minor second or a hum, right? Like uh, yeah. What do you mean cross strings? Well, because you can't play two notes on the same string. So yeah. The way that I always think about it is, I think about it as six monophonic keyboards. Yeah, I know that's what always broke, and they're aligned in places I don't like. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Like offset. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right, so like a like a harmonic second, you have to play across two strings. Yes, of course. Right. Yeah. Oh well, I don't even mean at the same time. I meant just oh, like, mean like like just going around. Yeah, yeah, 
going up and down the I thing, see, I like see. going down a minor, like, yeah, as opposed to like sliding up to hit the third, you obviously have to come like, so I'm just, I haven't, I haven't studied the shapes yet, yeah, but I just, I see, and it's I funny that you say it. Cause like, I don't even really care so much because I am making lots of interesting connections myself. Yeah. And it's actually been really great because I have a very good understanding of the piano keyboard. So like now that I'm seeing where they line up, mm -hmm. uh, it's been a lot more fun. And then the amp cheating. So no, that's fun. That's good. I, yeah, that's good. when I play live on this, I, I put distortion and reverb and delay on it. No, it's great. Yeah, you should. I should. <laughs> okay. So I have, wait, Ooh, what do we got going on there? Yeah, it's it's been it's been a fun wait actually. It, so we the great thing about that is it's rhythmic and we won't be aligned at all. I love it. <laughs> okay. No, no, it's good. It's good. It'll just sound crazy. I love it. No, I know. I know that you love this. So I'm I'm super down. I'll just if you you can hear me well enough. Yeah. If you you can turn up even. There we go. All right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so we're back with probably the uh, the most common guest at this point on the Music in Mind podcast. This is the third the third time veteran Maxwell Henry. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming back on the podcast, man. It's yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really upset at myself that I was trying. I don't, I was just doing like whatever I was doing. And then I totally realized that why don't I just play the tune, the notes of the tune oh. uh, of the banjo. So I don't know if you noticed at the end there, it started like opening up like yeah. a lot more. I was like, damn it. I wish I was just. Dude, it was that great was though. Cool. I liked when it was like crunchy trying to find each other. Dude, it cool. definitely was. Yeah, that took some turns. That was really great. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I don't get to do that. There, there's things I don't get to do very often that I really love. And it's like bang the shit out of the drums mm-hmm. and just make noise. It's great. <laughs> but the thing about it is if, you're, if your ears are opening and you're, you're, you're kind of chasing each other and following each other, then it's, it's connected noise. So that's good. No, that, yeah, no. But, but that's what I was saying. That'd be so funny. Like, imagine putting that out, like, and say, hey, guys, we just dropped our new single on, <laughs> out, out, on, out on all platforms this Friday. Like, <laughs> like why didn't no one like our song, dude? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Of course not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but yeah, it doesn't mean that it, but it, the, the last thing I wanted to say, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. Like, that's the thing. Like, if you make yeah. something and you love it and you believe in it, yeah, that's value is subjective. That's, a, that's another important thing. Value is 100% subjective. There's yes. no such thing as. So, is it worth there. monetary currency? That is the question. Now you just to get irre- someone to give you some for it. That's what I'm saying. It's almost, <laughs> irre- it's almost irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, so what, so what do you got coming up? What, what's well, dude, the biggest thing I have coming up, well, like I said, I'm graduating. That's going to be tight. Awesome. But the biggest thing I have coming up, and I guess this is a cool little promo thing mm-hmm. to the world of the music and mind audience. Anthony and I are actually going to collaborate on oh, yeah. a concert. Yes. Project, yep. hang out, whatever yep. we're, we're going do to something, do. Man. Whatever yeah. we're gonna make it uh, in the, like third week week of August. I yeah, think yeah, August, August 15th or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, Somewhere something like there. that. Maybe the seventh. I don't remember the day. Yeah, the third week of August, and uh, I'm I'm planning on trying to get us a show. Maybe the Carousel Lounge. It's this really quirky, quirky venue here in Austin, and uh, they have a lot of weird stuff in there. So we can be weird. It'll be great. Okay, I love it. Yeah, if we can be weird, like we should definitely be weird. Uh, but yeah, so like with that, I'm I'm in the process of developing like a what I'm calling a drum machine, but essentially it's like, because uh, yeah, I guess for, for those yeah. out there, like drums, like piano is where, like my main instrument and I love, I use it for composing and all that. And I'm trying to learn guitar, but drums is my passion and like absolutely what I love doing. And what's cool about it is it's what so many music makers lack yeah. uh, is an ability to create a convincing drum pad. Cause of course you can click drag all sounds great, but what everyone knows, like real drums, Yes. hit different yep no pun intended absolutely no but um real. so i'm really i'm really passionate and kind of going back to what we talked about i'm passionate about like giving people the tools to really understand music and the music that they're creating mm-hmm. and so i want to make something that like will allow someone to like either build like live drums for themselves have live drums happen or like just yeah Yes. Try to get out of this click and drag mindset. Yes, absolutely. So very much in the the beginning stages of this, but Anthony has been a master of live performance manipulation using this super awesome. (laughs) It's manipulating. Using this. uh, It's magic is what it is. We've talked. Yeah. Basically it's just magic. Uh, (laughs) It's just magic. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) Very scientific. We're not going to get into it right now, but, uh, yeah, so that's really what I'm dedicating a lot of my time to right now. In addition, I am producing uh, artists here and there. I have cool. just finished tracking an album that I've been producing for awesome. one of my friends, artists, for the past like almost year and a half. It's, okay. it's feeling good to like get done and put yeah, out yeah. into the world. When is that um, coming out? So a lot of the singles have already come out. Oh, cool. Uh, Okay. But, uh, but then like there's the back half, which is like, which there, there's a lot of cool songs that are different because like uh-huh. he, he does sort of like, like it's like definitely in the pop rock world, Nice. but I've, I've also my influence, you know, mm-hmm. I try to take the pop world yeah. and pull it back as far as I can. Um, so we definitely did some cool stuff, but I'm also working with a couple new artists and they're actually students, um, from NYU that I've met, okay. uh, and I'm really focusing now because like with the album I've done, like did every, composition, orchestration, all the instruments you hear for the most part. And now I'm just really trying to hone, hone in on drums 
and if this drum machine could even have a melodic harmonic component to it, which I think it very well would, yeah. should, uh, that's kind of, yeah. Sweet. That's, oh, oh yeah. Uh, a melodic harmonic component. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'm doing. And I, yes, thank you for having me on again. Cause this is, I love it. And of it's, course. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming and talking to me and everybody. Look up Maxwell Henry on Instagram. Maybe you'll get 10,000 followers off this and you'll actually develop a little bit of a return. And I'll be like, oh, social media is the only way to go, guys. Like, just build your content. Like, make sure your followers are there. Like, hashtag what you need. Hard you know, DM bio tag. my favorite. What's that? Those, those fishing people, they're like, promote on our <laughs> channel. Hard DM. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> oh, man. Cool. Oh, All right, well, cool. well, look him up. Thanks. Thanks for coming out. Good talking to you today. Yeah, man. We'll talk soon. Thanks for listening or watching, depending on if you are listening on the stream or watching on YouTube. Remember to like, leave a comment, subscribe, go check out Max's Instagram, and thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.